If you just learned that you have a kidney stone and it's still in the kidney, how you manage this stone is way different than how you manage stones elsewhere in the urinary tract. If you're curious on what you need to do next, you're going to want to watch this video. Hi, I'm Joey Weichman and welcome to Stone Relief. So for years, I struggled to understand the difference between kidney stones that I would have that would be actively passing, which were most often located in my ureter, and then also they typically find some stones that were still in my kidney. And it took me years to really kind of develop the understanding of these things, but there is a very different strategy that needs to be taken with stones that are either in the kidney or stones that are in the actual ureter. Uh, so you probably are not getting a lot of great information from your doctor either, because I know back when I would chat with my doctor about what I needed to do about both of these different stones and the strategies, you know, really it was kind of met with just, well, probably drink more water and well, let's get you scheduled for surgery or maybe here's some drugs. And neither of those, other than the drinking in the water part, really sat well with me. So as I continued to learn more and challenge the you know modern medical establishments way that they manage these things, I began to develop an understanding and the strategies that really need to be employed to be able to successfully manage stones that are still in the kidney. So today we're going to dive into those topics a little bit deeper. And the first place that this starts with stones in the kidney so understanding your stone's density. So what do I mean by this? So density when it comes to kidney stones is going to be represented in something called Hounsfield units or HU. If you're curious to know more about this topic, we have a whole separate video on this that you can dive into and really kind of nerd out. But in essence, what you need to take away from this is that weak density stones are going to be less than 750 HU and dense stones are going to be greater than 750 HU. You might be asking yourself, well, where do I get this HU thing from? Well, that leads us to the next thing we're going to talk about. CT scans are what you need to be able to provide density for your kidney stone. And these are really the gold standard when it comes to kidney stone identification. They are the most powerful and they're going to find all the different stone types that exist. There are lots of different stone types out there. Some of them are not going to be visible on x-ray, some of them not on uh, ultrasound. So CT is really kind of the catch-all. And it's a gold standard for a multiple reasons, not just its identification power, but it also provides us with a 3D image, and that 3D image also provides us with stone length, width, and most importantly, stone diameter. Because stone diameter is really going to be at the root of whether or not a stone can pass through our urinary tract. The length, which is what you typically get when you're using like an ultrasound or an x-ray, uh, is not really indicative of success of passing. A stone can be pretty long and still migrate its way down our urinary tract. However, if it's too wide or too big in diameter, it's going to struggle. And this is where people run into problems. So a, C a CT scan is going to provide us with this. But it's also going to provide us with stone density. And this is really the most important thing that we need to take away from this. Because if we know the stone's density, we can begin to employ certain strategies to be able to help us better manage this. Now, typically I only recommend a CT scan for the first stone. And what I mean by this is that your first kidney stone or the first time that you've ever had a CT scan, because CT scans use ionizing radiation, not a fan of it at all. We are exposed to a whole host of different types of radiations across our spectrum in our day. So limiting this type of stuff is really, really important. And that's why typically I only recommend it for the first stone. Kidney stone types generally do not change, especially over like a short period of time, like three to five years. So once you understand the density of your first stone, you kind of have it locked in unless some other dramatic changes have happened, whether it be with drug introductions or um, you know, different dietary changes that you might be making that might shift the type of stone that you're forming. But in general, most don't change. So once you get that locked in with a CT scan on that first stone, then you can use other things like ultrasound, which are not involving in any kind of radiation whatsoever, or lesser radiation type of you know, services like an x-ray to identify stone location, hydronephrosis status, and things of that nature. But CT scan right off the bat is going to get us what we need. And let's talk about more about the different strategies that we can employ once we're armed with this density information. Okay, so now that we know that density is important, what do we actually do with this information? So the first thing we're going to talk about is going to be kind of the, the ugly side of things, and this is going to be stones that are what I would call dense stones or high-density type of stones. Now, generally with these stone types, and it's just even with weak-density stones, but just laying a foundation here, stones that are less than 10 millimeters 
generally can pass for most people. Now, there are going to be situations, uh, you know, whether it be an anatomical type of impairment where you've got a urinary tract which has like really tight turns or maybe a, a slight narrowing. These are really rare type of situations, uh, but that might preclude your stone from passing. But for most people, less than 10 millimeters in size, which is a centimeter, can pass through the urine. And this isn't just me spouting off thinking my opinion. This is actually something that's stated in the American Urological Association guidelines, which are published and also provided to all the urology centers across not only North America, but also the world. They're generally in consensus about this. And we have a whole video that dives into this topic more. So if you want to check out that and what the AUA has to say about passing kidney stones, go check it out because it's not something that you're very often going to see talked about by your doctor or your urologist because they want to push you towards surgery and drugs versus you trying to pass it on your own. So there's a video there if you want to dive in. Next, stones greater than 10 millimeters. This is where we're talking about some sort of a sur surgical intervention. Now, the procedure that's used is really going to vary based on individual circumstances. It not only involves where the stone's located, uh, its size, um, you know, the density that they obtain, hopefully from using a CT scan, all these things the urologist is going to weigh out in determining what type of procedure is appropriate. And again, you can find out more about that guidelines and kind of their decision-making tree that they use by looking at our video on the AUA guidelines. Now, a couple things are gonna help lend to your success if you are in fact dealing with a more dense kidney stone that is gonna have to wait to have a procedure in order to address it because it's likely not gonna pass on its own. So avoid chugging water. And by chugging water, I mean just like high volume quantities of water. You know, this is generally greater than 16 ounces at a time. Uh, maybe a little bit more than that for most people, but just high volumes of water coming into your body. Because when your body already is dealing with a kidney stone and there's you know decreased renal capacity to be able to process your blood and turn it into waste, which is urine, and we're forcing a bunch of water down there as well that it needs to process, you're dealing with kind of a crippled system to begin with. And anytime you're forcing a bunch of water and you're just gonna set yourself up for more pain. So focus on nice, even, consistent hydration. If you're looking for tips on hydration, well, guess what? There's also a video on that you should check out. Now, also something to consider. Most often, stones that are still in the kidney are still potentially actively growing. Now, every stone type forms a little bit differently, but if you're having kidney stones, these are a result of diet in almost every instance, like 99% of the instances. These are a direct result of either inappropriately eating something or what you're eating is causing some sort of metabolic dysfunction that might be messing with urine pH. So, Changing what you're eating to stop further growth of this stone is going to be really important to your success because maybe you're starting off with a four or five millimeter stone once it's been identified, but over the course of weeks or months, it still can grow and often does. So paying attention to this is super, super critical. Also, any pain that you're going to be experiencing, this is really driven by obstruction. Now, pain is going to vary in different levels and the obstruction is going to be uniquely tied to that. So hydronephrosis is also another term that gets thrown around when it comes to talking about obstructions and there are different grades of it. There's some low grades uh, and then there's also some really severe grades where you've got a lot of pain but it all deals with urine backing up into the kidney and the extent to which that kidney stretching is really kind of linked to how much pain you're feeling. So again this ties in with water consumption but when we're trying to address that pain be super cautious about using NSAIDs or opioids. And by NSAIDs, these are just non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Uh, things like Advil, ibuprofen, things of that nature uh, are NSAIDs. And they can actually <laughs> prevent stone passage, like you, know, you successfully passing it, because it screws with a bunch of different mechanisms that are related to kidneys and your blood flow. So be cautious on this. If you want more info, there's a video about it in our blog section. So go check that out if you're looking for more information. Next, we're going to dive into talking about weak density stones where there's a whole bunch more stuff that we can do outside of having to basically kind of manage things until we have a surgery in order to deal with this kidney stone. So we'll dive into that in the next chapter. Just a reminder, this information is available in written form on our website. Find the link below in the description. If you're one of the fortunate people that form a weak density kidney stone, <laughs>
count yourself lucky because it's relatively rare. These are the probably the smaller percentage of all the kidney stones that are formed out there, maybe in the 10 to 15% range of all the kidney stones, but there's a lot that we can do with it uh, when it comes to knowing that stone density. And again, weak density kidney stones are those that are less than 750 HU from a, a CT scan. Now, the first thing that you need to start looking at if you've identified that you do have a weak density stone are stone dissolving products. And these work on stones of all sizes and really it is, <laughs> it's a miracle. So tell you a little story here. So I, back when I was dealing with my first kind of set of kidney stones when I was in my 20s, um, I learned that I had about 30 kidney stones between my two kidneys. Uh, I had an active nine millimeter kidney stone that was passing and causing me a whole bunch of pain and problems. But there are also 30 other ones between my two kidneys. And these ranged in size from a few millimeters to all the way over two centimeters. And the doctor presented me with a surgery option. It's the only option that was available. It's a percutaneous nephrolithotomy. It's PCNL is also what it's known as. Super invasive. I was not interested. I technic, you know, just typically, you know, gravitate towards more naturopathic type of things. Don't like drugs. Don't like surgery probably of the same mindset if you're here watching this video. So I spent an entire year trying to figure out how I could pass not only the stone that I was dealing with, but also get rid of those 30 other stones that were laying around in my kidney that were just going to cause problems down the road. So I developed a product. Uh, it's called Cleanse, and we'll link it down in the video notes. It's on our page. But this is a product that dissolves kidney stones, literally. I, I got rid of all 30 of my kidney stones that are hanging out between my two kidneys, over the course of about of a year time span, it took to break those down. And you can do the exact same thing. So as I had mentioned, it took me a year, but generally for most people, they're not dealing with 30 plus kidney stones like I was. You know, they've got probably one actively passing and maybe, you know, one or two in the other kidneys. And it does take time. Now, I don't really understand the, the mechanism completely as far as why it takes more time than with stones that are in the urinary tract or in the ureter. Those tend to break apart much faster. Uh, my theory is, is that it has to do with the velocity of urine that's passing over it. They're getting exposure to those stone forming elements and it's passing over it. There's turbulence and it's starting to break those stones up where in the kidney, yes, it is saturated, but there's a, a lot higher degree of volume of urine. The stone dissolving elements in our product like ours uh, it's probably diluted a little bit by the urine and the water that's in there. And there's just not as much high velocity turbulence to kind of break that stone apart. So that's my theory. But nevertheless, I just know that it takes time in general. So over the five years that we've had this product in the marketplace and the you know countless tens of thousands of people who have had success with it, their general feedback is that usually for the stone in the kidney, it's about one to three months. Whereas if you have a stone in the ureter, maybe a couple weeks. So there's a difference there. So be patient and continue to take whatever product you choose to use continuously and consistently over time because it does take time for that product to be able to build up in your system, to be able to have the impact that you need. But it will work if you're consistent with it. Next thing, hydration. <laughs> I know I preach about this a lot, but it really is important. So not only does hydration have to do with flushing out other stone forming elements that might contribute to the growth of your stone, just keeping your body regulated and open. Because if we're trying to pass this kidney stone naturally, when you're consistently hydrated, your urinary tract remains more dilated than it would otherwise. And by dilated, I mean open. So the more open that it is, the more likely that stone is going to be able to enter the urinary tract and get flushed out versus entering it and getting stuck and held in a position and causing you a ton of pain. So focus on nice, even, consistent hydration. And again, if you're looking for tips on how to accomplish this through your day, there is a video like we referenced in the last chapter on hydration that you should check out. Now, set, just like with dense stones, we still want to be conscientious of preventing future stone growth because it's going to take a couple months for us to attack this. And if we don't make changes, like sometimes what we're taking to try to dissolve this product gets counteracted by the growth of the stone based on what you're eating. So it's a two for thing. We need to do this and we also need to do this. We need to make dietary changes. Next, when it comes to pain, again, no different than with dense stones. They're still causing the same level of obstruction. There's going to be different grades to it that are going to be associated with different levels of pain. Again, be careful with NSAIDs, be careful with opioids if they're prescribed to you. Um, 
not only from an addiction perspective, but there's a, just really nasty withdrawal symptoms that you can get. And again, things with NSAIDs, it can actually prevent the passage of your stone if you're not careful. Fortunately, most stone dissolving products on the market, including the product that we made, that I made, Cleanse, they address pain. So you're kind of getting a two for one here when you're dealing with stone dissolving products that are on the marketplace. So if you're taking one of these, it's not only going to go to work on breaking apart your kidney stone, but it's also going to go to work on pain, which is super helpful. But again, super important to be consistent when you are taking that product. And if this is something that you're interested in, there's going to be a link down below in the notes and um, give it a try. It's worth a shot. Natural products do not work for everybody, but <laughs> if I've got a kidney stone and I'm in pain and I want to get rid of this thing, especially if I have a weak density kidney stone, it's worth a shot. Visit our website if you'd like to join a community of people learning to manage their kidney stones naturally. See you in the next video.